I think all that happened last time is, uh, got out of, uh, church prison. Queen found me, said, you're hired. Now, now I'm now running yep. the country. I'm running the country poorly. Based on Tal's warning, the Queen tells you that it's time to start deploying the magics you have developed for the kingdom. You and the Queen begin to experimentally deploy your magically engineered beasts near the capital. Crosses between dragons and elephants that you call dragophants aid with the construction of towers and walls by wrapping their trunks around huge pieces of stone and lifting them up high with their long necks. Their vestigial wings are too small to allow them to fly away, but they use the wings to swat away insects. Beetle moles, horse-sized moles with black carapaces and huge hands, that's horrifying. Jesus Christ. Are deployed in mines and quarries. Their ability to spit acid and their ruggedness in the face of cave-ins and avalanches proved quite useful. Dodecapedes once again transport goods on their, on their long backs. At a gallop, the many-legged giant dogs can outrun a carriage pulled by good horses. A small batch of baby dragons is aged at an accelerated rate while keeping the docile nature they normally grow out of. The first dragon riders in millennia are trained. And then, as winter comes to an end and the weather warms, it all begins to fall apart. This might be a shorter stream than we thought it would be. <laughs> I created a bunch of uh, enhanced monsters and obviously was not good enough to make them uh, tame. Vivamancy might be a problem. Or you made them too tame. But they'll just die. All right, waiting for the stream to clear up because it's uh, pixelated with the motions. Uh, a dragon suddenly begins to thrash violently with a stone still in its trunk, destroying the very wall it helps build. It falls down dead with blood trickling from its ears, the true cause of death unknown. A, be a beetle mole spontaneously combusts. Oh my god. <laughs> hurling acid all over the nearby quarry workers. A dodecapede suddenly bolts for the mountains, taking all its cargo with it. <laughs> the queen takes no chance with the young dragons and has their throats all slit in the night. Your own baby dragon is safe. Nice. I didn't lose my, my only child. The, a similar fate befalls the rest of your engineered creatures. The people of the kingdom mutter about the hubris of the kingdom for repeating the folly of the ancient. Everyone knows monsters can't be tamed, they murmur. Increased vilification. And meanwhile, the kingdom has not gotten any closer to matching the power of the Magisterians. It's, I mean, it's really good we started off this way because now I'm just ready for it to, to all crumble. <laughs> to be executed publicly. It's fine. You finally decide that it's time to take a break from your magical research and treat yourself to spend some of your <laughs> stipend. Yeah? Yeah, you think you earned a vacation? I think job well done. Some shops are no longer very relevant to your new life in the capital, but some of the newer shops are quite interesting. Where would you like to spend your money? You I have 1,162 gold. I this is your last chance to spend money before the climax chapter. I think I should probably gear up. <laughs> If not against the Magisterians, probably against your own people. You visit the old weapons and armor store. You notice that the swords and armor are selling at a discount now. Apparently people don't think that melee weapons and physical armor are going to be all that useful in an age of magic. They're probably right, come to think of it. You focus on the items that might be useful against the Magisterians and their negation blasts. A shield, uh, you can a single negation blast, uh, negation of wand. Probably gonna take this, this is probably handy. Hold on, what was this really expensive one? Order leather armor with obsidian uh, nodes built in to stop all magical attacks. Man, that would be really good, that wouldn't would it? That would be nasty. What did you miss you... last time? I built a bunch of magical monsters and they fucked off because I'm shit at making magical half monsters. Of, half of them just... One of them spontaneously combusted. So now I'm going to buy the shield. Ooh, okay. What did you want? A crest on the shield. Dark sun, a gear, a crown, an eye, a tree, a sun, a flame. Wow, I know what all of these mean. Um, let's go gear. Let's go gear. Hindsight, 2020. Probably should have just made the automation stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might have been better when I was choosing what I could do. You did choose uh, one of the things you are not good at. I thought, like, this wasn't that bad. <laughs> Obviously, Kyle, we're in the late game. Look at yeah. where we. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what I was thinking last time. Yeah. All right, let's go into the magical jewelry store. You go to the new jewelry store, hoping for a nice selection of magical curiosities. Unfortunately, the demand for magical items appears to have exceeded the supply here in the capital, and the store is full of only one kind of item: silver pendants in various shapes. 
There must be nearly a hundred of them in, on display cases, and not a trace of any other kind of magical item. Uh, yeah. Do you have something that's not these? You ask the shopkeeper. Sometimes, he says. Not often. Not now. You suppose this is how stores selling used goods usually work. If the goods are great, people wouldn't sell them off to begin with. You're go you going to buy one, the shopkeeper says. They're supposed to be good luck of various kinds unless you wear more than one. Then they just make you feel sick, so don't do that. Running your hand over the different pendants and display cases, you get a sense of the kind of luck you they might give. The fox head with a citron eye is attuned to vivomancy. The eight-pointed star with a sapphire in the center is attuned to divination. And the dove inlaid with alabaster is attuned to glamour. The, uh, the other schools of magic are not represented. Perhaps users of negation and automation met more unfortunate ends over the years. You can choose one pendant to wear for 100 gold. I'm probably going to get the divination one. Probably handy. Um... You, buy, you buy the sapphire pendant, slipping it on, and you feel attuned to divination. What's next? I mean, I have the best pet already, okay? I don't need to go to the pet store. It's whatever. Clothing store. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you want? Uh, something tells me maybe I should just try and be very charming. Uh, the shop seems to have fancy doublets in, in whatever color you would like. You pick out a navy outfit that looks particularly flattering. The doublet and matching jacket you buy are positively dashing. Gain some charisma. Yeah. You wear your new outfit at the store. You think you'll you'll be reluctant to ever wear anything else again for the matter. Let's just take a look-see at the pet store and show off my dragon and call them all losers. You could just buy a baby dragon if you had 600 gold still. I could buy a second one. Um... I mean, uh... You go to the Capitol's pet store, a noisy store full of brass cages containing all kinds of small, strange monsters, many of which you have trouble imagining as someone's favorite companion. To be honest, you really don't have much of a reason to be here since you already have Stormageddon, unless you also wanted a unique little pet that probably wouldn't do anything but look cute. The shop has a huge, uh, huge variety of tiny pets for sale, the result of ancient Vivamancy student projects running loose and breeding in the wild. It looks like this pet store also buys pets. But you would never dream of selling Storm again. It doesn't give you the option. What kind I of pet would you never want? either, so it's okay. Do you do you want a unique magical hybrid creature for a hundred gold? That's fine. I think I'm good. I think I'm done. I think we're, we're all done. A you don't even want to look at what the hybrid creatures are. This is the last chance you have to spend gold. Sure, fine. Let's take a look. Liars, serpents, traditional. Uh hmm. You want a serpent? You want a flying something? Or it's just a dog or a cat, I guess? <laughs> Another flying thing. The fire section contains a variety of winged creatures, ranging from tiny bluebirds to odd birds with lion heads. What sort of flyer do you want? Something that looks like a bird with a lion head? Like a griffin? A curious chimera that uh, that results from a lion head sitting on a bird's body seems to be a popular one. It does look somewhat majestic despite its small size. A sign says this type of creature is called an anzu. Let's see if that's real. It, I believe I heard the name before. What color scheme would you like for this pet? Oh my god, these are terrifying looking. <laughs> these are not not at all what this is describing. No. <laughs> are you looking at the dinosaur? <laughs> yeah. Wait, here, I found one. I'll DM it to you. The dinosaur on zoo is nothing at all like this. I believe this is what they're talking about. It looks kind of cool. Hopefully it uh, sends. It just Hopefully I'm like, looking. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow. Those do look funky. All right. What color? Uh, so it's either blue with silver, orange with white, green with black, gray with white, brown with black, or crimson with black. Let's go crimson. The edgy one. Edgy. You single out a cage containing exactly the color combination you're looking for. The Anzu inside looks up at you expectantly. Aw, are you able to purchase this? Are you also to purchase this thing? Yeah, sure. All right, you got to name it. I'm going to name you... Uh, An edgy bird lion. What is it? Bill. <laughs> you have Jeff, Bill, and Stormageddon. Yep. God. Got a weird pet. <laughs> What a, what a achievement. 
You you pet Bill the Anzu on the head. Did you want to sell your baby dragon storm again? Now that you have a different pet, that's the that's the only other thing you might do here. God, it, no. <laughs> it's like I have a new pet. Get out of here, Storm again. <laughs> no, no. You decide you're done spending your hard-earned money. Hey, here meanwhile, we go. Meanwhile, Magist meanwhile, Magisterian airships have now been spotted by the general public. The smooth-hulled ships cruise by towns near the negative sea without making contact or even revealing any Magisterian crew. The aerodynamic metal ships equipped with huge wands of negation are an enigmatic but certainly do not seem friendly. Fear grips the kingdom as the people worry that not enough has been done to protect against this threat. What? Ridiculous. We need to consider how to keep the people happy during this time of uncertainty, Queen Thecla says. You are once again meeting with the queen in your usual private dining room. Things aren't as bad as they think. They're just panicking. If we can get them to focus on something besides their troubles... This is no. This is not a problem that demands a magical solution. Blessed Advisor Sam objects before you can give an opinion. The people simply need to have faith in us and in Abraxas. We have done well so far to avoid going too far down the path of magic. Why ruin that merely to develop petty vices to entertain the masses? Queen Thecla casts a skeptical look at Blessed Advisor Sam, as if she's a little tired of his being in the room. Yeah, he does nothing. Any ideas? The Queen asks you. Uh, you know, I'm charming. I'm divinationing. Broadcast mm. the culture of the capital. Is you. All right, your majesty, we have a wealth of entertainment here in the capital that could help lift the spirits of the border towns. What do you say? Let us apply the same magics that broadcast your image and voice to our best actors and musicians so that the whole kingdom benefit from the delight of the capital. For once, Blessed Advisor Sam just shrugs. That's reasonable, I suppose. Queen Declanos. Let it be so. You go from musician to musician, from one acting troupe to another, offering to broadcast their works to distant sounds that they themselves have never visited. They often ask whether they will be able to hear their listeners' applause. You assume you assure them that this is so. Couriers carry large enchanted mirrors to distant towns, and the performers themselves use a giant mirror in the palace garden to broadcast their music and play to those distant artifacts. The constant performances in the garden create a pleasant atmosphere in the palace, and Queen Thecla approves. Meanwhile, you understand that the performances are a great hit in the border towns, which have stopped their worried murmuring about the looming threat of the Magisterians. Hey, yeah, we might have carry. our bellies exposed to all of these massive war machines, but we are a pretty dog. Uh, <laughs> you literally have the freaking helicarriers from Winter Soldier hovering overhead, and you're just like, but look, concerts. <laughs> You can, you can see Billy Elliot in theaters. As the threat of the Magisterians looms, you find yourself taking more and more comfort in your relationship with Tao. Your beloved Huntress finds more and more excuses to spend time around the capital, though she also finds plentiful excuses not to attend formal dinners. Out of the public's eye, you, she, and Noodles enjoy shedding your formality, engaging in pillow fights, finger painting, bubble blowing, and general playful antics that will surprise anyone who only saw her disembowel giant beasts. One romantic spring evening, you, you're attending a concert with Tao in the palace garden. You manage to get free admittance for Tao though you're connect, through your connection to the queen. The band consists of a mandolin player, a flutist, and a hand drummer, and the audience is energetically clapping along in a jaunty song. A huge mirror suspended at an angle above the band will convey their sound and images to mirrors scattered in towns across the kingdom, but it's another thing entirely to see the band live. The band finishes their set and the audience cheers and applauds. Come with me back to my apartment, Tal says to you. I have something I want to discuss with you. Something is surely weighing on Tal's mind. You follow Tal away from the performance. Golly. Tal's apartment in the capital is somewhat spartan, though she has strewn fluffy pillows around to make it look more lived in. She sits down under a four-post bed and invites you to do the same. You oblige her. Tal gets down on one knee, surprising you. She produces a ring box from her belt pouch and opens it. Oh. A ring with a white gold gleams within. There is no gem. It's plain, which you suppose matched Tal's taste. Fishy, we've known each other for an awfully long time, Tal says, and I'm pretty sure there's nobody who will ever understand me as well as you. So do you want to get married? She blinks away tears and smiles. We've never really seen Tal struggle to be brave before. You can just say here, just say, nah. Fuck, I'm leaving. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can say yes, no, or no, and I want to leave you. <laughs> 
Uh, sure. Yeah, we're all gonna die. Might as well have a good time. <laughs> Kyle laughs with delight and hugs you. Oh, yes, 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 yes. She then gives you an amused look. You're thinking of having Noodles officiate. You accuse her. Admit it, you were thinking it too. You kiss, looking forward to the day you were pronounced husband and wife. Golly. Getting hitched. You receive a letter from your mother asking you to return to Ackerton to sort through some of your things she found in the attic. She threatens to throw them away if you don't come soon. Being slightly sentimental sort who hates to throw away mementos, and since you were looking for an excuse to visit Mayor Koss anyway, were you? Well, um, nice. You agree all haste. Tal, who had been visiting the capital to report to the Queen, happens to be headed back to Ackerton as well, and you decide to share a wagon. You're trying to take that is becoming pleasantly familiar. Neither you nor Tal minds camping, and to save time, you agree to camp out wherever you are when night falls instead of the end. The first night, though, you find yourself in, lo in low country with a storm threatening on the horizon. You hike a little out of your way to get some high ground in the shadow of a mountain, and there you make camp. You and Tal make camp at the foot of the mountain and send you a pleasant fire going. You both share a blanket and cozy up. The setting reminds Tal of some of her adventures out on the plains, and she tells some of her exciting stories about her fights with the roaming monsters. My god, after with concluding all setups we're getting back to back, it's like, okay, things are... <laughs> this is gonna get real Something's bad. Something's about to happen. Shit is about to go after sex. After concluding another triumphant monster slaying story, Tal grows glum. Of course, if one of those neighbor vessels came around, I don't know what I'd do. Well, my sword fighting skill just seems to seem so primitive compared to that thing I saw. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna be. Should I just be blunt? Like, yeah, I kind of fucked up. <laughs> That's up to you, my man. You just, I, you just. Hey, I think she's your wife now, so. I did. If not I, engaged, you know if not your wife engaged. I did. I'm just gonna. I did fuck up. He just leaves you instantly. It's you. I'm sorry, Tal. You say? I tried my best to come up with a way to protect the kingdom, but I failed. Oh, you haven't failed? Tal gives you a hug. Not yet, anyway, and I bet you won't. You've always been a fast learner, and, and the neighbors haven't even really invaded yet. By the time they do, I bet you'll have learned all kinds of sweet spells that can save us from them. Maybe. You say? Definitely, Tal says. Just no negation spells. That stuff's dangerous, and about... every time you've done it, it's gone horribly wrong. Sure has. Don't bring back the, the fucking... the school. Uh, I like to think you still haven't told her about Vera. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what about making You're monsters? like, I murdered, I murdered seven people. <laughs> I murdered a lot of people. <laughs> including a saint. What about making monsters? Tal oh, frowns. Not if you can help it. Automation? Man, you, sh you shouldn't tell her what you tried to do like a few months ago. <laughs> uh, Tal looks up at the storm clouds above. Um, maybe a little bit would be okay. You still have no idea how you're going to save the kingdom, especially not without using some kind of dangerous magic. You'll think of something. Again, Pat. She's like, see, you can use some fancy spells. And then you list off all the spells, and she's like, but not those. Just don't do any of those. That's all magic. <laughs> As you're setting up camp at the foot of the mountain, Tal says, the, the future is coming fast, isn't it? Soon we're going to be married. Isn't that weird? I'd be your wife. I don't feel like a wife. She hesitates in the middle of setting up camp as if afraid the domestic activity might hasten her wife wifely transformation. Like a magical girl. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Uh, I think you can still be whoever you want to be. You say, slightly mollified, Tal continues to help set up camp. What about you? She says. What do you think about being a husband? I don't think anything has a chance or whatever. It's just a name. It's a title. <laughs> Tal smiles. Yeah, maybe not. It's not like our vows will be magic or anything. Just a promise. Tal thinks for a moment. Although, didn't the ancients sometimes think some stuff like that really was magic? Love was considered one of the magics of the sun. You say the magics that affect life in subtle ways instead of flashy ones, but I don't know how much uh, much more about it. It might have been just superstition. Hmm. Tal says, Fond fondling the engagement ring you bought her so that you two would match. Magics of the sun. I wonder if that makes your engagement rings magical items. Maybe. You can see. Tal walks over and gives you a kiss, then looks thoughtful. 
Magical? Maybe. I haven't thought about it before. You set up one big bedroll and sleep in together, but Tal seems to prefer snu snuggle tonight instead of anything more athletic. So that's what you do. Yay. You arrive in Ackerton, and you and Tal part ways to visit your mothers. Uh, tell me about tell me oh, all that's her. Tell, tell me all about your engagement, your mother is saying as she pours you some tea. The smell of peppermint provides her... Uh, pervades her living room, which is full of quilts and lacy pillows she made herself. Did you propose yourself? How did you do it? No, it was actually Tal who proposed. <laughs> you say? It was very sweet. You recount the events of that night. Your father taps out and leaves the house after about two hours of such questioning, claiming that there is some pressing business at his construction site. As you re relate this story, you're vaguely aware of a kitchen drawer opening and closing behind you. But you think little of it until you turn and see that your mother's holding a large butcher knife. What is that for? <laughs> you ask, Im imagining the answer is something like cake. Your mother lunges at you with the butcher knife. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Were you ready for this guy? Nope. You quickly stand, and though she aimed it to your neck, she stabs you in the chest instead. The pain is excruciating. The lunge, she lunges at you again, and you raise your arm to block, only to have that arm sliced open. Quickly losing blood, you feel as though you may pass out. You splash your steaming tea in your attacker's face. She shrieks, and you see the distraction to, to, to topple the tea table, sending the tea set crashing to the ground. You hide behind the wooden surface. That's not my mother, you have the presence of mind to think. You have moments to decide which spell to cast. No, no, healing. <laughs> You keep your hand pressed to your chest and with the dormant life energy in your mother's wooden house to flow into the wound. Moats of light streaming from all directions. Me medical therapivo! You murmur oh, and the wound... <laughs> you just yell it really loudly. And the wound seal. You still feel queasy, however. Your mother's impersonator kicks the table away just as you draw your sword. Humble, humble though it is, it's still longer than the butcher knife. Tell me who sent you. You say, clamoring to your feet. I'll find out one way or another. Seeing that you've healed yourself and that you're holding a more intimidating blade, your assailant apparently thinks better of attacking you. She runs for the front door. I'm aborting the mission, she cries to nobody in particular. It's time for the backup plan. Someone is listening with, div with a divination, but who? You can't afford to give chase. You're too worried about your real mother. You cast a divination to find out where she is. Mysterion nomai, repirio matermia. Your divination reveals your mother tied up in her own cellar. The stone room is mostly empty, save for the kegs that stand as a monument to your father's long-abandoned attempt to brew beer. Your mother is lightly dozing as you cut her bonds and gently wake her up. Where am I? Your mother asks. What happened? You're in your cellar. You say. As for what happened, maybe you can tell me. Fruit cellar friend, she came to borrow some sugar. I think it was. Your mother recalls. When I let her in, I had hardly shut the door when she knocked me off my feet. She started to tie me up straight away, and that was all I knew about it. Just then, the ground shakes and you can hear a crash from above. Something tells me we need to get out of here. You say. Lead the way, lead the way my dear heart, your mother says. You run up the stairs, pause to note that there is now a ragged skylight filled with negative energy residue in the living room and continue out the front door. Oh, my house. You leave your mother's house just in time. Another negative energy explosion levels the house, leaving only a black cloud where it once was. My home! Your mother cries. It's slightly heartbreaking to think of her losing the place after so many years. The shrieks of fling Ackerton seem distant as you contemplate the loss of the home you grew up in. Looking up, you see a Magisterian airship, its sleek metal hull looking entirely alien above your, your normally quiet hometown. The vessel is a smooth half-sphere flanked by large black cannons. A white shaft on a swiveling mount stands at the bow of the strange ship. Its barrel is as wide and tall as a person making it unlike any cannon you've ever seen. These weapons are manned by figures wearing bull-shaped helmets, gray cloaks, and black enamel chain mail. The powerful automation magic keeping the airships aloft makes all the hair stand up on your body. What in the name of Abraxas is that? Your mother says. Oh, please let this be a dream. It's a Magisterian scout ship, Tal calls from down the street. She unslings a longbow from behind her back. Fishy, just get your mom to safety. She takes aim at one of the Magisterian crew. Tal, are you crazy? You say. You're the one who needs to get inside. Magisterians, she means the neighbors? Your mother asks you. Sorry, mother. You say. I think they come for me, and you're 
Well, I just wish I hadn't brought this on you. The black cannons on the side of the airship swivel and fire to your left and right, leaving craters of clouds and negative energy in the street. As soon as you turn to look behind you, they cut off that means of escape as well, with another blast of negative energy. The blasts are interrupted when the Magisterian's gunner gets one of Tal's arrows in the face. Thanks, Tal. You call out. What? What would you ever do without me? She replies. I... Oh, crap. She leaps back in time to avoid a negation blast at her own feet, lobbed by another wand-wielding Magisterian on the airship. I'm okay, Tal calls, though it's unclear who she's reassuring. Your mother grips your arm in fear. Another one is stepping up to the cannon. Do something. Well, it sounds like this is a handy-dandy time to use my automation magic. I surrender. Just, just, just. I have a plan. I give up. <laughs> Honestly, this might get me at an ending where not everyone dies, but I'm going to try and fight. Let's wrestle control of the ship. It will be a monumental feat to take control of the giant vessel, but you've got to try. You raise one... Every time you try to do automation, it says, it's going to take a lot to do this. Sure is. <laughs> you raise one hand to the sky and point to the other at the great airship. Uh, air... Mm -hmm. Give me a second. Uh-huh. Aeronavis spiritum mia ligarda akipizi. Your your mom's screaming, "Do something, save it!" And you're like, "Hold on, I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce this." Is this Italian? <laughs> Lightning strikes your raised hand and arcs up to the airship. A black whirling shield of negative energy appears in front of the airship just before the lightning strikes. But your crackling magic penetrates the shield and envelops the whole ship, which lights up gloriously. You see the crew gyrate wildly and fall. Apparently, your spell also electrocuted the whole ship briefly. Nice. <laughs> you spread your consciousness through the whole ship, feeling every little system come alive as your spirit touches it. The sense of power and control is exhilarating. I didn't know automation could do that. Uh, hey, let's go. I got my own you boat. Just, you just turned into Generator Rex for a second. <laughs> you, you will the ship to make a gentle landing in the middle of the road, where it wobbles slightly in the absence of a real air dock. Nobody emerges from the vessel. Uh, presumably all died by electrocution. You now have an airship, it seems. I, we That's might actually son. be able to win this war if I can actually just keep doing this. I know this just is just a scout ship, though. Oh, yeah. That's my son, your mother says proudly. Let's do something. Tal says to you, her gratitude mainly with mild annoyance. Having taken care of the airship, you realize you need to contact the queen immediately. You head to the mirror in the center of town that is used for broadcasting concerts from the capital. You cast a divination to reverse the flow of communications. You establish communication with the palace guard. It really seems like getting this kind of divination just made you a very good phone guy. I sure am. I am the media. You, est <laughs> you establish communication with the palace guard and after some negation and sh er, negotiation, sorry, you did not shoot them. Uh, and sharp words for a random gardener who happened to be near the great mirror then, you get the queen. You try to rotate the mirror to minimize the glare from the sun overhead. Yes, Scrog Fishy? The queen says. Is that the queen? Your mother says in awe, having followed you. Similar murmurs float throughout the crowd that has gathered behind you, but you pay them little heed. Akriton has been attacked. You tell the queen. I think they came for me. You, re you relate the story of how, le how a letter from your mother was actually a trap set by a fruit seller Fran, a spy working for the Magisterians, and to thank you saved her. You cut out what you say. I said, and to think you saved her apples. How dare. How dare she. The beginning of the war, then. If they get their way, the queen says. But they may be willing to parlay. Tell me, would you be willing to act as an emissary for the to the Magisterians? I wonder if we'd avoid a war if you could convince them that we are as advanced as they are. <laughs> we have to lie. I can lie, probably. If I send an ordinary diplomat, they'll be unimpressed. But if I send you, then maybe there's a chance. What do you think? Could you convince them that we are their equals, not to be trifled with? Cast I like, I like the first one's idea that if I'm captured, all is lost. <laughs> You're like, I, Actually, it's me. Okay. Casting divination now might help. Because then, even if someone higher up knows that we have divination magic, and then we parlay... They might think, oh, they have powerful magicians. That's possible. Th it, this, in this case, the divination might actually give us an Since edge. you're trying to tell them something. But what you're, what you're trying to tell them is also a lie. Yes. But part of the lie is making them think we have multiple. Yeah. 
I think That's this fair. is at least worth trying. You briefly cast divination to learn which option would be better, war or peace. The stunning complexity of the paths the future could take in j just the next few months overwhelms you. In all your experimentation with divination magic, you have never seen such a complicated delta of rivulets and streams of time. You try to make sense of this vision, as in this book has wildly diverse paths from this point. <laughs> Two major streams of time diverge from where you are now, one high and the other low. You gather the high road must be pieced, but, at, but as it is on the high ground, many rivulets fall into the other stream, war, while others slip into a stream that eventually cascades into oblivion, oh. presumably meaning your death. A final jumping off point before this great waterfall leads to a tiny whirlpool swirling around that looks like a crystal ball. Oh? The other stream is the other stream is more turbulent, but is more likely to carry you to the finish. You see that one key choice leads to the three colors of water: pure, muddy, and black. The black waters carry you further, not the far future. These looks, gr but the far future there looks grim. The pure water grows wine, its power diminished over time, and the muddy water will just keep going along turbulently. All three seem likely to travel to one of three final destinations: a green valley. A whirling hurricane, or a black and purple death cloud. Examining the water itself, you see some trace of yellow and green muck that must signify rot. But it doesn't look bad. You feel confident you'll make it you'll make it to one of the other futures, unless you invoke some truly powerful glamour. Your vision ends. Okay. Kai, what are we supposed to make of this? Well, I kinda of figured out a little bit. So, okay. so as it stands, obviously, it's very clear that a precarious path of peace uh, could very easily lead to war and then very easily lead to just my death. Yeah. Or I could just decide first strike now and that might is more guaranteed to take me further, but it's all going to be shit. Well, it doesn't sound... Well, one led to a green valley. One said no, no, it like, ends well. I, I meant like the path there is all going to be shit and then there's three endings at where it converges again and splits to three endings. Gotcha. So, like, the two paths are just first strike and peace, and peace is very precarious. War is... Yeah, you'd be walking a tightrope on the peace path. Yeah. But I think peace is the most possible, because I, fortunately, looking at my stats, I've got some pretty good charisma. Yeah. I've got and some, some good, good ancient, ancient history. Ancient history. I know things, and I can talk. I'm just not good at fighting, which, honestly, maybe... It, I actually might have a good chance if I just go for peace. Also, um, your fucking Adria cannot fight them. No. In any capacity. No. We have it would be prepared. you versus the entire Magisterian army. I would lose. <laughs> Here we go. Queen looks relieved. So you think you can succeed? Have faith, my queen. You say, Chapter 7, The Here Neighbors. Oh, guys. Um. Yep. 